This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to look at how a limousine crash that killed 20 people Saturday in upstate New York is linked to a man who is an FBI informant long accused of lying to the government and getting away with it. The crash in the town of Skohari was the deadliest U.S. transportation disaster since 2009. The limousine had failed an inspection last month and was not licensed to be on the road. The New York Times reports that shortly before the crash, one of the victims sent a text message to a friend saying she was worried about the limo's condition. It has since been revealed the company that owned the car had a record of repeated safety violations. Earlier this year, it was issued written violations after vehicle inspections by the New York State Police and the Department of Transportation. On Wednesday, state officials arrested the operator of Prestige Limousine Chauffeur Service and charged him with criminally negligent homicide. He is Noman Hussain, the son of a Pakistani immigrant named Malik Shahid Hussain, who is the company's owner and also an FBI informant. In 2001, Malik Shahid Hussain was arrested for helping people cheat on driver's license tests. In exchange for avoiding deportation, he took a job as an FBI confidential informant, posing as a radical arms dealer in FBI sting operations. Hussein was a key figure in the FBI's case against the so-called Newberg Four, four black Muslim men sentenced to 25-year prison terms after they were convicted for placing what they thought were bombs in New York synagogue in 2010. Defense attorneys say the men were entrapped by Hussein. We turn now to a Pittsburgh man who was entrapped by Hussein. His name is Khalifa al-Akili. He just finished serving nearly eight years in federal prison and was released September 25th. In a moment, we're going to speak to him directly. He's in a halfway house. But first, we want to turn to a clip from the documentary Terror. That's T in parentheses and the word error. Terror where Khalifa al-Akili describes how Hussein, then working as an FBI informant in Pittsburgh under the name of Mohammed, tried to recruit him for a terror plot. It was so clear that I didn't want to meet these guys. Like, seriously, like, I literally made up excuse after excuse after excuse. The next morning, he walked up here to the corner, and that's when, uh, you know, quote, unquote, Mohammed came from around the corner you know, just appeared out of nowhere. You know, he had his hotel downtown Pittsburgh, and yet he was here in Wilkinsburg at 9.30 in the morning without no car, no vehicle. He just so happened to have that card for my mother on him. I reluctantly agreed to go to McDonald's and, and, and uh, you know, have some coffee with him. The morning that, uh, that we all came in here, we actually sat at this, this first booth right here, and that's whenever he began to talk about uh, his people being involved in jihad and whatnot and fighting. And... Khalifa Alakili joins us now on the telephone from Pittsburgh. Khalifa, welcome to Democracy Now! Congratulations on getting out of prison after almost eight years. When you heard about this news of the worst U.S traffic uh, accident in almost a decade, and that the limousine that was used, that was illegally on the road, um, was owned by um, the FBI informant who led to your imprisonment. Can you talk about your response and exactly who uh, Shahid Hussein is? Yeah. Good morning, uh, Amy. I, I was completely devastated by this news, the fact that this man is allowed to continue to, to, to live among, uh, uh, you know, citizens and, and, and to be out here when this guy, is, he's a rodent. You know, he, he, he's a liar. He's a thief. He's a criminal. He's, he's, a, he's a scam artist, and, he, and he's a danger to society. And, and the fact that this took place, and, and more than likely the, the money that was used to to build this company with money that was paid to him by our government. I mean, this is ridiculous because of because he's an asset to our government and he's bringing them manufactured cases of terrorism. Uh, this is why he's allowed to continue to stay in this country and to flourish and to run these illegal businesses in which he's constantly cutting corners and, 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 and 
it's it's just sad. Twenty people die as a result of, of this guy's negligence. I mean, this is sick. Uh, Khalifa, you know, he, talk about how you met Hussein. Yeah, I I, I met him um, through the other informant that was involved in in, in the case, um, uh, Sharif. He he told me one day, he said, "Hey, man, my brother's coming in from out of town, and and I really want you to meet him. He's a, uh, a real resourceful guy." You know, and I, I think you guys will get along, be able to relate. And so that's how the, the initial um, introduction was made. I only met this guy uh, uh, once or twice on two different occasions. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to meet him from the very beginning because I already knew that he, he was an informant. I knew that he was trying to entrap me. And, but he was very aggressive uh, in, in trying to pursue me and, and, and to sit down with me, to talk with me. And it's just sad, man, to hear this news. You know, it, it really is. Can you talk about where you're speaking to us from and how his actions led to your imprisonment? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from Pittsburgh. Um, I'm in a halfway house. Um, I'm, right now, I'm just focused on trying to, uh, uh, you know, my transition back into society to reunite with my family. And, and this guy's actions have led, it led to my imprisonment because of his attempts to entrap me. And then after I publicly exposed him, then the government came in with a two-year-old picture of me and some friends having, having fun at a gun range and used that to indict me and, and, and give me a, a rack of years in federal prison. And yet this guy is responsible for uh, directly or indirectly for the, for the, 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 the homicide of, of 20 people, and he's not going to do a day in jail. How did you figure out he was an FBI informant? Yeah, I, I knew because uh, I knew that Sharif was an FBI informant. So the fact that this guy was in, introducing me to, to another guy, uh, I just I knew immediately. Mm -hmm. Well, Khalifa, I don't want you to get in trouble. You're at a halfway house, and I know you have to get off uh, the air at half past the hour. So I want to thank you very much for joining us, Khalifa Alakili, uh, joining us, talking about how he was entrapped by Malik Shahed Hussein, who is the man who owns the prestige limousine service, the limousine that was illegally on the road. A number of his cars um, had uh, failed inspection. And yet this limousine carried uh, 20 people, the driver and 17 friends between the age of, I think, 24 and 34, who are all going to a 30th birthday party. Two of the couples in the car had just gotten married. Um, the driver, of course, killed, and two bystanders. We're joined now by two other guests who can talk about the man who owns this service, not exactly clear where he is right now. His son has been arrested on manslaughter charges as a result of the accident. Here in New York, Sam Braverman joins us, an attorney who represented one of the Newburgh, Newburgh Four, who are convicted after Shahed Hussein led the group and organized the scheme. He'll tell us about that. And in Los Angeles, Lyric Cabral is with us, co-director of the film Terror. That's T in parentheses and the word error, terror, a documentary that follows undercover FBI informant Saeed Sharif Torres, uh, who um, uh, Khalifa was just talking about, another FBI informant. Um, Lyric, we met you at the Sundance Film Festival, this astounding film, a few years ago. If you can finish um, Khalifa's story for us, how he figured out who Shahed was and the significance—I mean, he not only was involved in the jailing of men in Pittsburgh, but also, as we'll talk about with Sam Braverman, uh, the men in New York who were then entrapped and are serving decades in prison at this point, Lyric. Yes. So Shahed Hussein, um, in Pittsburgh, he was going by the name Muhammad, um, and he had been assigned there, presumably, to investigate Khalifa al-Akili. Um, but because of the Newburgh 4 case, because that was such a publicly critiqued example of entrapment, um, during that trial, Shahed Hussein was photographed and was exposed. Um, his photograph was placed on—actually, it was the front cover of The New York Times. And so, because of all the publicly available information, um, 
in part due to Sam Braverman and other defense attorneys on the Newberg 4 team, um, there was basically this publicly available information about Shahed Hussein, including recordings that he made of the Newberg 4 that were entered um, as government evidence during their trial in 2009. So all of this was sort of public. And so when Khalifa had his suspicions about Hussein, um, Shahed Hussein in Pittsburgh, under the name Mohammed, gave Khalifa a business card um, with a number. And Khalifa, due to his suspicions, he Googled that phone number, and it referenced a number in one of the Newberg 4 trial transcripts that was publicly available. So Khalifa, through this Google search, was able to actually confirm on paper that Shahid Hussein was an informant. I mean, that is simply amazing. This guy gives him his number. He's very nervous about him. And he checks it out on Google, and he sees it's the number of the FBI informant in the Newberg 4 case, which brings us to Sam Braverman. Good morning. Hi. It's great to have you with us. Um, talk about this case in Newberg. Now, yes, it was front-page news, but I think for many people in this country, it's long been forgotten about as they rot away in jail. Oh, absolutely true. So the trial is essentially Maksud. Uh, that was his nickname in our case. Of course, I don't think anybody could honestly say they know what his real name is, because he, created, he did so much immigration fraud on his original asylum <laughs> application. So I don't think anybody believes that. He could be Fred. I mean, nobody knows his real name. But beyond that, he comes to Newburgh. He's tasked to go into Newburgh. He goes into mosques, and he's specifically tasked— Newburgh, a very depressed uh, town. Newburgh is, Newburgh is a very depressed town. He was in Wappingers Falls before originally, and he went into a mosque, and the people said, get out of here. Get out of here. He went to the Newburgh Mosque, and the imam there said, get out of here. Why? Why were they telling him to leave? They were telling him to leave because he was in there to say, let's have a jihad, let's have a holy war. And the people in the mosque were saying, well, this has nothing to do with us. We are here to pray. We're here for a peaceful mission. And so he kept getting thrown out of places, and he found a disaffected person in a parking lot. And that's how the Newburgh case his began. Name. And his name was James Cromartie. So, James Cromedy was a loudmouth by his own absolute admission. He shot off his mouth endlessly. And then, like Khalifa, he one day he said, you know, I don't have any interest in this man anymore, and hid for a month and a half. Hid. The FBI knew exactly where he was because they were trailing him everywhere. Else. But every time that Maksud would knock on his door, he was hiding behind the door. Or he'd call him. He'd say, oh, I'm out of town. I'm in Philly, wherever I am. But the FBI was paying Maksud to do something. He had a job, like a salesman. So as a salesman, he only gets paid if he makes the sale. And he has to tell the person who wants to make the sale, let me tell you anything you want to hear. So in our trial, Maksud Sahid Hussein said things like, I'll give you $250,000, a barbershop, free cars, free travel. My client, uh, Laguerre Payen, was totally impoverished. And my client was bought for food. So in every meeting, my client is eating. That's how you got my client to join this thing. There's a you know, if you feed somebody rice and they're starving, they'll believe anything you ask them to believe because they're starving to death, as was my client. Mm. So that, that was the premise that got everybody into this. Once they were there, Shahid Hussein just kept doing things. His everyday task was to make the story better. And the FBI was continually trying to reel him in at the same time. So they're saying, no, no, don't offer those things. You can offer $5,000. So he went off the reservation and said, no, 250 is good. And then he did these things. And then he lied to his handlers about it. And they didn't know about it until they actually heard the tapes where he said, 250 I offered you 250 You didn't want it. How about a car? So it was endless. And he said, you know, I'm going to fly you on a plane. My client said, I can't go anywhere. I don't have a passport. You're talking about the, the, the most uneducated, the most un salvageable young men, this is, this and they is, target him. This is very significant, because um, Shahid knows enough that he cannot just be offering financial inducements. He has to, as he talks about, the cause. They have to be there for the cause, right. jihad, not for the money, because that'll get the FBI in trouble. So I want to go to the HBO documentary, The Newberg Sting, which features secret recordings the FBI made of conversations between the undercover FBI informant Shahid Hussein and James Cromedy, uh, one of the men who became part of the Newberg Four. You have to listen very closely, because, well, Obviously, this is surveillance audio. It's hard to understand. The clip begins with Shahid Hussein. What is your understanding that you make a lot of money and still be on the side of Allah? That'll be good, but I have to know what I'm going to do to make the money. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of ideas, okay, for you. You can get some people. You'll be nice. you be a party. You'll be nice. Okay. Do you have to use that word, bodies? 
Uh, but you said that you were good to get some brothers together. And... Don't worry about the brothers. Don't worry. You're going to meet some brothers. This be easy. <laughs> Inshallah, I, I'm hoping we can, uh, we can do it. So that is Shahed Hussein saying you're going to get some brothers together to James Cromedy. And this is another clip from the secret FBI recordings. This one begins with James Cromedy. None, none of these brothers got jobs, huh? Uh-huh. Only there's three of us without no jobs. True. But actually, how do you think we feel, huh? We getting ready to do all this, huh? We ain't got no money in our pockets, huh? How do you think we feel? Look at me, bro. Uh -huh. How do you think they feel? Yeah. If these brothers are doing for money, I don't need them, subhanAllah. What no, I, I, I talked to them, them okay. already. They already know. Yeah, okay. okay. And They're not even worried it, about it. It is for, uh, for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's all it is. And if they won't need for money or greediness or they, they think they're going to make any money or, uh, or angerness, please do not, because this is jihad. Mm. This is jihad. And that's what jihad is. But you, you know what they think, huh? Uh-huh. They can use the money, though. So that was Cromedy at the end, who is now in prison, saying, yeah, yeah, I, I know you're saying jihad, but they really need the money. Right. So—and that's Shahed Hussein. And again, to bring this back, for people who are just joining us now, Shahed Hussein, who runs the Prestige Limousine Service that was involved in this deadly car crash, uh, he was cited numerous times for dangerous vehicles. This one was not supposed to be on the road in Skohari, and it's the one that crashed, killing all 20, all 17 people in the, in the car. And, and the driver, as well as two um, passers-by. Right. So, talk about, then, defending your clients and how they ended up in jail, because these are such damning—not so much of your clients, they're clearly desperate, and sometimes trying to get away from him. He's coming up with the plot all the time. He shows them synagogues. He shows them a military base. So, in the case here, there were a lot of different ways. Remember, you're comp we are compressing time, in a sense, because it starts in um, an early 2008, and it goes all the way to 2009, nine months of recruitment. And during this nine months of recruitment, people are leaving. They keep walking away. They can't find people. My client comes in. The first time he appears on tape anywhere, he says to Shahed, by the way, thanks for the job. I really needed a job. It doesn't say, I'm here to do damage to the world. I need a job. I mean, literally, waifs on the street. So this persistence is what, ultimately, the FBI is allowed to use to say, let's compress it all into one moment. What do we have? We have people saying in clips, I'm here for the job. What the trial was about was pulling back that, that Band-Aid, that, that bandage that hides the actual wounds. And the wounds were Shahid Hussein doing whatever he wanted to do. And that's the connection with the case here today. It's not because he was an informant then and lied then that he's somehow legally responsible for this. It's because every day of his life and every minute he's ever had, he's had no responsibilities for anything. So he comes and he lies about his immigration and his application for asylum never punished. He comes here and he creates a fraudulent business, never punished. He comes here and he does a bribery scandal at the DMV, and he's never punished. He comes here and he lies at the trial up in Albany, never punished. He comes here and he files bankruptcy, lies on his bankruptcy application, never punished. Comes here at trial, and then for this whole case here, lies in every step of the trial, exceeds his authority, makes offers, binds the FBI to things, never punished. At trial, he lies on the stand. McMahon turns to the jury and says, this man is lying never held accountable for it. The government standard says you're doing a great job. In the Terra case, in other cases, he's done, and now this. So the timeline is for all of us to watch this to say he's never been held accountable in his life for anything. So what does he learn from that? He learns sociopathy. The ability to say without remorse, without any concern, without any hesitation, I'll do whatever I want. So if I want this truck on the road, it goes on the road. And who says no? You, me? No, we're still paying a salary. He's making hundreds of thousands of dollars, doesn't pay taxes on it. He lies and commits felony crimes. What do you mean he doesn't pay taxes on it? He didn't pay taxes on it. The government just pays him money. You mean the FBI? Yeah. In our trial, it came out that he got $66,000 in the year before our trial. He didn't pay taxes on that money. It's a gift. So what does he learn? He learns to do anything he wants. He goes to Pakistan, wherever he is, who knows if he's actually there, and his son is here to stand up for him. Maybe his son takes the beating for him. I don't know. When did he leave? The Who US? knows? Uh. Who knows? He comes and goes as he pleases. Have you ever been to JFK and see the line to get in and out of JFK? Do you think he stands on that line? He doesn't. He just disappears. During our trial, he disappeared during the trial, came back. Nobody says we know where he is. The FBI agent handler who was on the trial, on the stand, 
So as he goes, did you follow him in Pakistan? No. I asked him, how do you know he's not actually a terrorist? Maybe he's the actual terrorist. Isn't, isn't there a question of he first came to the United States from Pakistan fleeing a murder charge? So he says, right? We don't even have proof of that, but he absolutely said that he was a victim of an unlawful arrest and all these other things. We have no proof that that's true, and the FBI never offered proof that that was true. The only thing we know about the FBI is they said about the four in the trial, they said in a letter, in an internal memorandum, they said, we know these guys are totally incapable of an operation without our informant. Well, I want to go to uh, comments that have been made, a statement that's been issued by uh, Muslim groups in the U.S. Uh, the Muslim Solidarity Committee, Project Salam, and the Coalition for Civil Freedoms issued a statement about Hussein saying, quote, the limousine company is the latest hit on this road of calamity. Shahid Hussain's debt to justice has not been paid. The years spent in prison and the years still to serve for the phony crimes that Hussain engineered for the FBI cannot be recovered for the men he put away. And the terrible irony of a felon convicted as part of a DMV scan, who's now responsible for the faulty operation of a vehicle that killed 20 innocent people, is not lost on us. So, uh, Lyric Cabral, could you uh, respond to that and also say um, what you recall from Hussein's testimony, uh, you said that, in fact, you thought he was taking a directions from the FBI. So, one of the things that has always troubled me about Hussein, in response to the Project Salam statement um, or that you just read, is going back to his initial charge, which was DMV fraud. Um, the, you know, the FBI always says the FBI's argument is that it needs a criminal to catch a criminal. But going back to that actual act, which was in the, I believe it was in, two, in the early 2000s, um, my question is why did the FBI choose to hire this individual? Because that very act, um, which for which they could have prosecuted him and put him in jail, is ultimately what killed these people. Um, d fraud, getting vehicles, actually the in, what he was convicted of, what he should have been convicted of, what the FBI knew that he was doing was helping people to receive drive driver's licenses illegally. And his son, in this accident, did not have a license to drive this vehicle. So I'm not, I, I have not heard much scrutiny around the FBI. Um, to date, I have not heard the Bureau make a statement about its informant. But I actually question the Bureau, really, uh, and why, why they chose to employ this individual after knowing his capability <clears throat> around these crimes. Lyric, um, you spoke to the mother of David Williams, one of the Newburgh Four. I think they're in jail, what, for 25 years, when yes. she learned of this horrific a car crash that involved the man who ended up getting her son in prison. What did she tell you? Um, Elizabeth McWilliams was just horrified. Um, you know, she legally, she's just wondering, like any mother would, she's still trying to get her son out of jail. Um, she understands that, in, despite, you know, that an injustice occurred. So I think her first response was a legal one. Um, going back to sort of the point that I spoke on, um, is there any way that the FBI can be held accountable for this man now that it's clear? Um, that the original crime, when they hired him, is what killed these people, ultimately. So she's wondering how this current event might impact her son's charge, mm -hmm. might impact David's um, freedom. And the last 10 seconds, your response, Sam Braverman, sure, when I, you heard what happened in Skahari. You know, it's more of the same for this young man. Uh, Hussein does whatever he wants to do throughout his life. And it's not just that there are sociopaths among us, because there are. It's when our government tolerates this sort of craziness, like the last story about Scott, uh, governor in Florida. We'll just tolerate the nonsense. Let's not close our eyes and hide in the sand. If you hide in the sand about the environment, if you hide in the sand about justice, if you hide in the sand about all the issues that are important to us, why do we ever think we should be crediting you? The bottom line is they, they wrap their arms around a liar. And here's the... Here's what reaped from what they've sowed. And as Michael German said in the remarkable film uh, by David Halbrenner, uh, the HBO film, uh, The Newberg Sting, quoting Michael German, an FBI agent, uh, after 9-11, after 9-11, uh, his colleagues at the FBI were saying, you know, the rules no longer apply. And he's right. walking around saying, what are you talking about right. the rules no right. longer apply? The rule, he says, the rules, you mean the Constitution? <laughs> I actually was sat with Mike and I watched Lyric's films. Great film. And he's a good guy, too. Hmm.
Sam Braverman, lawyer for one of the Newberg Four, Lyric Cabral, co-director of the award-winning documentary Terror, which is now on Netflix. And we want to thank Khalifa, who joined us from the halfway house in Pittsburgh. We thank you so much, uh, Khalifa al-Akili, uh, for enlightening us as we continue to try to find out what has taken place on the roads of upstate New York and where, uh, at this point, uh, Shahed um, Hussein is. His son is in jail. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, yes. yeah, How Fascism Works, a new book by Yale professor Hello. Jason Stanley. Stay with us.